How many of you have actually heard of this uh, phrase, food as medicine? Can I see a hands? Okay, so what does that mean? Does that mean that we use food to prevent disease? Do that, does that mean that we use food in place of medicine? Or does that mean that we combine foods with medicine to be able to achieve uh, better health outcomes in terms of fighting disease? Well, that's one of the themes that I'm working on now, and I thought I would share with you, so bringing you to the cutting edge of this. Now, when we look at food, we tend to think of uh, our culture, we tend to think of our, uh, what we're comfortable with, and we think about our everyday lives. And when we think about innovation with food, this is the list that we tend to think about. We're looking at lots of technological advancements, some very, very exciting areas that are going to change the way that we actually are able to have products and interact with our foods, leveraging many of the developments uh, that are coming out of, of, of technology, including what uh, you just heard about in terms of quantum uh, uh, computing. And yet, on a global level, uh, we are actually having a different type of problem that needs a solution as well. And this is actually published from last year from by, funded by the Gates Foundation and the journal Lancet, um, talking about uh, from the Global Burden of Disease Study, 11 million deaths attributable to dietary risk factors, specifically the low intake of fruits and vegetables, uh, nuts, legumes, and whole grains. And so we are looking at a problem that's right in front of us that actually where the solutions may also appear in front of us as well. How do we actually reconcile this problem with innovation and how do we find new solutions? What I'm going to share with you now is how biotechnology, life sciences, pharmaceutical development is giving us a new appreciation of how foods can be used for health and to fight disease. And the way that I'm going to introduce this to you is by describing the drug development uh, progress that's been made over the last 30 some years. I run a nonprofit organization called the Androgenesis Foundation. We have been involved with the development, successful development of 34 FDA approved drugs and devices. Against this backdrop of the last 25 years, more than 800 new drugs approved. So the interesting thing to ask is what knowledge, human knowledge, scientific knowledge have we gleaned over this period of time that allowed 800 drugs to be approved. Now, I want to share with you something you already know, which is that genomic medicine, or the knowledge about the human genome, has led to gene therapy. But this has been a long course of about 30 years. Remarkably, in 13 years, we went from not knowing about the human genome to actually sequencing it. So what do you think we've actually learned in this span of time? We learn many things. Now, we don't understand everything yet, but we actually are able to get the information. Among the things that we've learned is the human kinome, and these are the enzymes that our cells use to produce proteins, and we pretty much know everything in the body that actually represents the kinome. Think about it as an evolutionary tree of sorts of chemical reactions in the body. We've also deciphered inside cells many of the cell pathways from the outside of the cell seen on the top all the way down to the nucleus, which is sort of the command center. And each of these uh, colored shapes represents a potentially druggable target, meaning that if you were in charge of a biotech company, you're trying to do a startup, and you had some university brain power behind you, you might actually choose one of these in order to be able to develop a new drug. And indeed, of those 800 drugs that have been developed, most of them actually target one or more combinations of these pathways. So what's interesting is that these druggable targets that tell us something about how our body responds to drug treatments also respond, these pathways also respond to the foods that we also eat. And we know that foods can actually act on these pathways because of our knowledge of the biotechnology um, uh, drug development uh, system. And in fact, we've also been able to dive into foods to look for some of the chemical structures that our mother nature has laced into our food supply. And we call these bioactives, broadly speaking. This is just a partial list. Many of these chemicals actually give foods their color. 
or their flavor. And most of them are designed to be health defenses for the plant that, from which they're derived. So they either allow reproductive uh, defense so that they can uh, they attract bees for pollination, or they actually may become natural insecticides to prevent uh, insects from eating them uh, over the course of a summer, for example. So again, plant defenses, when humans begin to eat the plant defenses, they suddenly start to interact with our own uh, body's uh, systems. And I just wanted to share with you, uh, share with you one of the uh, experiments that I've done uh, comparing foods and drugs. This is actually in the top black line, an assay system that we use to study whether or not a drug or chemotherapy drug or another pharmaceutical might inhibit bad blood vessels that are growing in our body. These bad blood vessels could be feeding cancer, for example. So as you can imagine, the shorter the bar, the more powerful the effect on the cells to prevent cancers from growing. In this case, blood vessels, I'll show you in a second. So this is actually a, a gold standard assay developed for the pharmaceutical world that I was involved with. And when I was doing this experiment, I realized that you, can, you could FedEx overnight a chemical, a drug, and find what its effect is within a few days, but you could call a pizza in uh, to the same lab in 15 minutes and you wouldn't be able to study it. So we then set up across breaking down the food system, and then when you actually begin breaking down the system and testing food components in the same system as drugs, you can see this is pharma versus farm, head-to-head -head in the same drug development assay, and remarkably, many of the same elements that actually uh, are in plants have similar or even better potencies than we see in drugs. And so again, if, you, if I were to disguise the names of the foods here and put the, a chemical name, a pharmaceutical name, uh, you might be impressed at some of the activity, the potency of some of these agents. But it's really not just about the food that we're learning about. It's, it's really, when it comes to food and health, it's really about how our body responds to the, infra, the, the substances we put inside the body. Remember those pathways I showed you? That's where the secret is. And it turns out that foods impact our health defenses. These are hardwired systems of defense that we're born with, and they're firing on all cylinders until their very last breath. These health defense systems now are pillars of our health, there are probably hundreds of them, but I'm now going to show you five of them. Blood vessels, angiogenesis, um, our DNA, our, our regenerative system, our microbiome, and our immune system. These are just examples of a few areas where we know through pharmaceutical efforts that there's actually very important implications for our health. So let's start with angiogenesis. I'm just going to show you a few examples. Blood vessels, very important, 60,000 miles worth of blood vessels packed inside our bodies. You can go around the earth twice with the length of these. When we have just the right number, you have good circulation. When you don't have have enough uh, blood vessels, you can have serious problems uh, in your body. And if you have too many blood vessels, it can also lead to disease as well. So healthy is in the middle, just right. It's like Goldilocks. Too little or too much actually leads to problems. So let me just give you an example with the, uh, using cancer, for uh, because we now know that tumors are forming in our bodies all the time. Every single person in this room has cancer growing in their body because we are, have continuous cell division, a few mistakes grow microscopic cancers, but they remain harmless, as you can see on the left, until blood vessels grow and allow them to expand up to 16,000 times in size in just two weeks. And so you can, this is a new area of pharmaceuticals to cut off the blood supply of tumors. This is something I've been involved with, and it's called starving a cancer. So we developed systems, like you see on the left, this is a ring, it's from a big blood vessel with blood vessels that, small blood vessels that'll grow outside and you spike that system with the same proteins that tumors release and you see this starburst shown in white of blood vessels that are actually growing outwards. You throw in a pharmaceutical agent that's effective and you can see you shut down all those blood vessels, the starburst disappears. You've actually shut down angiogenesis as a tumor would grow. And this is actually the pharmaceutical response in cervical cancer metastasized to the lungs, these little white areas in the black zones. You can see after a successful pharmaceutical response, you've cut off the blood supply to tumors, those tumors are gone. Now look at what happens when we actually go to the market and start picking out foods and doing extractions and trying to test them in similar systems. Remember this, um, this is actually the baseline. You spike the system like a tumor would, you see the blood vessels growing. And what happens when you put in 
extracts from soy. Shut that down altogether. And so soy has anti-androgenic effects, very similar to some of the pharmaceutical effects we've actually seen. Now, isn't soy dangerous for a condition like breast cancer? Well, the plant estrogen doesn't look like human estrogen. In fact, it blocks it. And we know this is important clinically because this is published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2009. 5,000 women with breast cancer, the ones at highest risk, found that those women who ate more soy had lower mortality and had lower chance of having their tumor come back if it was successfully treated. How much soy did you need? On average, about 10 grams of soy protein a day. That's as much soy you'd get in a glass of, mil of soy milk. Now, this is one study, and if you were a skeptic, you'd say, well, you know, it's a population study, so it's not rigorous like a pharmaceutical study. Well, here are 14 studies stacked end to end showing that in every single case, women who ate more soy had better survival, and in no case did they actually have more death. So again, this is actually how this case is developed from molecular biology to cellular biology to, to pathology. And this is the old adage from Hippocrates that food actually does um, have the medicinal effect. Tomatoes has lycopene, another bioactive. And guess what? Lycopene shuts down angiogenesis in that exact same assay I showed you, that, uh, that ring assay with the starburst. And this is a study of 46,000 men uh, from Harvard showing that those men who ate more cooked tomatoes, two to three servings of cooked tomatoes uh, per week, had an up to 30% reduction in the risk of developing prostate cancer. Lycopene in tomatoes shuts down angiogenesis, angiogenesis being important in cancer, including prostate cancer. Human consumption showing a dose response that actually reduces the risk. This is the, a very interesting thing. And then this is molecular pathology. You biopsy the prostate uh, cancer of the men who did develop prostate cancer and count their blood vessels. You can see the more tomato sauce you ate, the fewer the blood vessels and the less abnormalities. So this is actually how we're beginning to re- invent the ability to study food as medicine. This is exactly what's going on right now. Now, it's actually got big implications because food isn't all the same. The varietals make a difference. If you wanted to actually go into the market, and in the summertime you see all these choices of tomatoes, which ones would you want to have if you were a man at risk for prostate cancer? You'd want the one with the highest levels of lycopene. And here are four of them that you would choose from if you had those choices. So, how, so we need to understand the varietals and the differences. So, so we're just at the beginning of being able to tease apart this, um, uh, uh, this equation. Here's a list of anti-angiogenic foods. Um, I know everybody wants to take a picture of this. Uh, uh, and and uh, uh, I, I wrote a book called Eat to Beat Disease, and there are all these tables and charts. Um, it's actually in a bookstore over there. Um, uh, but this is really interesting to think about. What happens if you don't have enough blood vessels so you want to grow more. Well, we know this is important for heart disease because you want to actually grow new vessels for cardiovascular disease and also to solve the problem of diabetes. And this is interesting. We have found that there's a natural substance called ursolic acid that actually grows blood vessels and it's found in fruit peel. And, and look at this on the left-hand side uh, in the leg, not enough blood flow, but on the right-hand side, if you feed a laboratory animal that ha doesn't have enough blood supply with foods, chow that's made with fruit peel, you can actually see the return of the blood vessels after um, uh, 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 three days of treatment. Here's a list of angiogenesis stimulating foods for circulation, also a remarkable way of cataloging or reclassifying foods that actually can be useful. What about regeneration? We know with cell therapy, regenerative medicine is a gigantic field that's being worked on uh, by the medical device and the, uh, and the life sciences industry. Well, we know that as humans actually regenerate in, from the inside out slowly. But about 50% of our stem cells are impaired or lowered over the course of aging. And so how can we actually increase them? That's really the target of regenerative medicine. And here's just a partial list of conditions that we know, um, we believe, could actually use augmented stem cells or more better activity. Well, we know that diabetes, this is from patients with type 1 diabetes, their stem cells are impaired compared to patients who don't have diabetes, as an example. I could show you something similar clinically for all those other conditions I've actually pointed out. And we know that there's certain dietary patterns that are harmful to our stem cells, they kill the stem cells, and we know there are other patterns that actually boost them up. 
Well, how do we actually go beyond the pattern is then to go use the same systems that are being used for regenerative medicine therapeutics to begin testing food elements. And this is an interesting one. Um, everybody knows about that green tea is good for you. And people used to think that black tea has been fermented and oxidized and lacks the good stuff. But now I'm going to show you this is a clinical study of 19 patients in which they were actually had their um, uh, given a placebo drink uh, for a couple of weeks and then actually their stem cells were measured and then given two cups a day of black tea for one week. And you can see that they've actually increased their stem cells uh, on an individual level uh, for the most part uh, uh, just by drinking only black tea. No milk, no sugar, nothing caffeinated previously. This is full test, unfiltered tea. So it's really interesting to reconceive what it is. You have to just look at the data. Now, people don't need another reason to like chocolate, but I'm going to give you one. Drinking hot chocolate that's been spiked with high flavanols, dark chocolate, 80% or above, can actually improve your stem cells. This is drinking two cups a day over the course of 30 days. You can double the number of circulating stem cells and improve your blood flow as well. So again, these are eye-opening things because if I didn't tell you what it was and I just showed you and I told you it was a drug, you would be pretty impressed with the performance of these. Here's foods that stimulate stem cells. I don't have time to show you today foods that actually kill stem cells, specifically cancer stem cells, but that's a holy grail in pharmaceuticals. And we actually have discovered there are certain foods that can kill cancer stem cells, but help good stem cells as well. That's a, that's a completely different uh, topic. Microbiome, we now know that humans in our body, we, are composed, we have 39 trillion approximately bacteria that are healthy bacteria. This is very different from the era that many of us grew up in, where if you had bacteria, you wanted to kill them. You wanted to wash your hands. I mean, antibiotics were life-saving, but now we know that if you kill good bacteria, it actually can be deleterious as well. And here's just a list, partial list of diseases that we don't have solutions for in most cases that we are beginning to understand are linked to unhealthy levels or balances in our gut bacteria. So this is an entirely new future of medicine. But guess what? These bacteria live in our gut, and they are. They, and when we eat foods, it exposes um, uh, them, uh, the food exposure to them. This is a really provocative study of kiwi fruit. Two kiwi fruits a day times four days, and you measure the stool in healthy subjects from every single day, and you can see that just having uh, two kiwi fruits in the first 24 hours changes the bacteria that you can measure in the stool by improving the good bacteria as quickly as the first day. And over four days, you can increase another good bacteria as well. So these changes can be really quick. And harmful foods can actually similarly change the makeup very quickly. We don't measure this routinely in the clinic, but in the future, we will. There are other foods that actually contain bacteria. Yogurt is the best example of this, but there are other fermented foods, whether it's pao tsai, kimchi, or uh, a sauerkraut. And these all actually are exposed to the air, healthy bacteria grow in them, we eat them, and over the course of hundreds of years, cultures have realized that this is actually something that can be beneficial to us. And now we're beginning to dive down deeply and understand why. Here are some foods that are beneficial to the microbiome. Finally, I want to just close by saying the microbiome is connected to the uh, immune system, which we know is important because we be now realize that about 70% of our immune systems actually wrap like a jelly roll inside our intestines, and the bacteria talks to our immune system. Former U.S. President Jimmy Carter had melanoma that spread to his liver and his brain, and he retired from public life thinking that he was not going to survive. He received one of the biggest breakthroughs in medicine today, which is an immunotherapy that doesn't kill the cancer directly, but uncloaks the cancer from, that's been hiding from the immune system to allow a 90-year-old person's immune system to find the tumor as a health defense and to wipe it out. Now, this is the type of response that he got before treatment and after treatment. This is a CT scan of the brain. You can see uh, uh, tumor versus no tumor. And we do see this in melanoma, for example, but less than 20% of the people actually respond. So this is very frustrating, the difference between life and death, response and no response. It's one of the big mysteries today. And one of the things that's really remarkable is we're beginning to understand that the foods we eat may impact our immune system through the microbiome. And this is actually uh, a colleague of mine, Laurence Zivogel, at, in Paris at the Institut Gustave Roussy, 
found that in 200 consecutive patients treated with immunotherapy, those patients who responded had one bacteria that the ones who didn't respond did not have in their stool. And that's a bacteria called Acromancia mucinophila, and you can't eat that as a probiotic. You can only eat foods that cause your gut to secrete the mucus that it likes to grow in. And this is now changing the way that we think about um, how cancer patients are fed, because how many pa cancer patients that, that you know might be getting an antibiotic unknowingly and wiping out this bacteria that could make the difference between whether they respond or don't respond. This is also beginning to change this. And this is how it works. Pomegranate, it's got a lagitannin, a bioactive. It causes the gut to secrete the mucus. The bacteria, Acromancia, grows. It lights up the immune system. So now you have more fortified, more active immune system. Now you hang a bag of immunotherapy, and then cancer immunotherapy will then work on and allow the activated immune cells to go find that cancer. This is oversimplified, but this is what we believe works. And I, it's very personal to me as I figured this out because my mother, who was in her 80s, was diagnosed with endometrial cancer, cancer of the lining of the uterus that spread. And she was told by her doctors there was no chance to survive, and at her age, chemotherapy might be worse than the disease itself, and that she should actually just go under, undergo palliative care. So we actually took the tumor, did the deep dive, found the smoking guns for immune therapy. We then altered her diet, made sure she had the ecromancia, and after three treatments, nine weeks, we had a complete response, never had chemotherapy. She was actually able to be uh, completely saved, and this is her uh, today, completely well with no sign of cancer. So again, this is not a simple case, but a complicated way that we're beginning to think things. And then finally, let me just tell you, broccoli sprouts um, uh, also boost the immune system. And this is a study of 29 volunteers who were getting the flu vaccine through a nasal spray, and it found that if they gave them two cups of uh, broccoli sprout uh, uh, a shake uh, as a smoothie a day, combined with the nose spray, they had a 22 times increase in their immune response to the flu vaccine compared to people who didn't have it. So what I've actually showed you is not just food as medicine, but foods and medicine, where what's happening is that the technology that nature lays in the food is meeting the technology that we have within our body. This is really the future forward way to think about food technology as we undergo innovation, not just inventing new technologies, but really understanding the technologies that exist already. We're sort of hacking into the body and trying to understand what happens when you combine these uh, forces together. And there's implications beyond health because I haven't just told you something that you have to go out there and you have to invest in, you have to wait forever. But so some of the solutions I've shown you are practical. They're accessible to many people. They taste good. They're, they're science supporting them finally, and they're relevant to cultures no matter what culture you come from. And they're generally associated with positive experiences. And finally, I will tell you, I'm also involved with another program that's much more future flung, which is as we actually decide to go uh, um, into space and begin to settle on the moon and Mars and beyond, we're gonna have energy, we're gonna have fuel, we're gonna actually have great computing power, we're gonna have ships that'll get us there. But what are we gonna be feeding these people that are gonna be leaving humanity off the planet? This is something that needs to be figured out because we're not going to have abundance in terms of agriculture. We need to understand how does the hardwiring defenses within the body fit with the foods that need to actually support humanity once we leave the planet. So I hope uh, I, I sort of given you some provocative thinking, and I'll just close with this quote by the Nobel laureate Albert San Giorgi, who said that discovery consists of seeing what everybody's seen, but thinking what nobody has thought. And I think I've shown you foods that everybody can recognize, but I hope I've now left you with some new ways of thinking about how they may impact our health. Thank you very much. <laughs>